Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the first keynote of our second Homeschool Plus conference. Uh, this is a, really a delight for me to have Oliver DeMille here. Welcome, Oliver. Excited to be here. So my own children uh, went through the Thomas Jefferson Education Program. Uh, I'm a big fan of Oliver's work, uh, so it's fun for me that he's sort of kicking us off this year. Uh, thanks to Homeschool Life and G3 for sponsorship and the Learning Revolution and Blackboard Collaborate uh, supporting the conference. Uh, uh, if you are in the live audience, you can now look to the left of the map. You'll see some indicators that allow you to click on them. The star is the second one down. If you click on that twice, then you can click on the map and show us where you're participating from. It's also fun to put a note in the chat. Uh, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, and it is 7 p.m. Welcome, Kyle, in Topeka, Kansas. Brian, uh, the webinars are, are at most an hour, uh, but we do we will have a break before the the next top of the next hour, in which uh, Jerry Arrow or Jerry Mintz from Arrow will be coming. Canada, Utah, Texas, North Pole, Arkansas. Well, wherever you're listening from, or if you're listening to the recording, we sure are glad to have you here. So Oliver, this is sort of the fulfillment of a little bit of a dream for me, which is to bring you to my audience. I sure appreciate you doing this. I know you're quite busy. So I'm going to turn the time over to you. I'm your wingman. I'll help you in whatever way I can, and then I'll help you close out. That sounds great. You just jump in if if it gets bad. We'll be ready to go. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to be here today. Our topic is a Thomas Jefferson education, which for those who are joining us internationally, if we have any of those, it's we often refer to it outside of the United States as leadership education. Both of those are very descriptive titles um, because. The goal of Thomas Jefferson Education, or TJ Ed, as we often refer to it, is to help people get a truly great education, to not settle for anything less than greatness, to not settle for mediocrity, not settle for just getting base literacy, but going way beyond that and really aiming for greatness in everything we do. And if we look around at education today, in America, in North America, around the world, it's interesting that education faces a number of challenges, but almost all of those challenges can be fixed. We can solve our, our problems in education with one little change, and that little change will make all the difference. It's not budgeting. It's not more buildings. It's not teacher training, per se. It's not administration. It's not school boards, it's not the policy from Washington or Ottawa or London or even our state legislatures. The one thing that will fix almost every problem in modern education is great teaching. That's true at home, it's true of parents, it's true in the classroom with teachers, it's true in everybody who intersects or works with students, librarians, anybody who coaches, anybody who works with a young person can help deliver great teaching. And if we have great teaching, literally almost every challenge in modern education just disappears. We overcome it, we fix all the problems, and education is wonderful. And education should be wonderful. If there's anything in our society that should get close to the ideal, it should be idealistic, it's education. Sometimes when I'm talking about Thomas Jefferson education, I'm talking about leadership education and the principles of great teaching. I get people who respond and say, well, that's, that's idealistic, but how could we really do that? And I always respond, if there's anything that should be idealistic in our lives, it's the education of our kids. That We should be aiming for the ideal in, our, in the education of our kids. And so if it's idealistic, then good. We've got the first, we, we, we've taken the first step. Now we need to aim for greatness and go even higher. So how do we get great teaching? 
Well, Thomas Jefferson Education is built around the idea that there are seven keys of great teaching, and that if we apply those seven keys in any setting, in public school, in private school, in a charter school, in a home school, at the kindergarten level, clear up through doctoral level, and, and just lifetime uh, continuing education, professional studies. If we apply these seven keys, we will see the quality of education increase. And to the extent that we ignore or don't apply any of these seven, we see the quality of education decrease. And that's true if you know about TJ Ed and have been applying it for a decade, and it's true if you've never heard of TJ Ed. If you're applying the seven principles of great teaching, then great learning takes place. And if not, then it, to the extent that we're not applying those seven principles or those seven keys of great teaching, then great teaching is not taking place. So to kind of illustrate this or to kick this off, I want to ask a question to everybody participating with us today. And I want you to seriously think about the answer to this question. I want you to picture in your mind the best teacher you ever had, the best teacher you've ever had in your whole life. Maybe this was an elementary teacher. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a, a, a church leader, a community leader. Whoever it is, maybe it wasn't even a, maybe it wasn't even a person per se. Maybe it was a, a a great character in history that you took on as a mentor and and really tried to emulate them or or study them in depth. But for most people, it's it's a living, breathing person that they've interacted with. So here's the question: Who is the greatest teacher you've ever had? Think of that person. Think of that person in your mind. And here's the follow-up question. What made that person such a great teacher? Why were they the best teacher you've ever had? What made them so great? When I've asked this question, and I've asked it to a number of people over time, Hi, folks. It's Steve. Looks like Oliver maybe he got disconnected, and looks like he is back. It will take him a second just to get things back and going. Oliver, when you're ready, uh, we lost you at what made that person such a great teacher. Okay, good. So, what made that person such a great teacher? So, really think about that, because sometimes we get caught up in the mechanics of education, things like curriculum, things like, um, you know, grade levels, and what does this student need right now in math or science or history or social studies. And those are good things to focus on, but we can miss the deeper meaning that a great education is about each individual's life mission, their life purpose, the great things they can accomplish in the world, and the mission that they were, they were born to accomplish here. And when we forget about that, we sometimes miss out on the greatness that, that's there. And focusing on this one question, who's the best teacher you ever had, and what made this teacher so great? Focusing on that question can be extremely powerful as we try to be great teachers. So I've asked this to numerous audiences and thousands of people over time, and some of the top answers that I get from people are things like, he, the teacher really cared about me, or the teacher really knew his topic, or the teacher was demanding, or the teacher was fun, or he made the, he made the topic, he made the subject really interesting, or he saw something in me that I didn't even know was there, I didn't even see in myself. And those are the answers that we typically get, or things like those answers, from people when they ask this question. Who's the greatest teacher I've ever had, and what made him or her so great? And all of these things are great answers. It's a powerful question to ask, because if we're going to be a great teacher, which is the whole, the whole point of education, show me an educational environment that has a great teacher, or better still, more than one great teacher, and I'll show you a great educational environment where excellence 
is the norm, where quality is the regular daily fare. Show me an educational environment where great teaching is hit or miss and only shows up once in a while, and I'll show you one that suffers, that just doesn't have the same quality, just, just doesn't have the same level of, of a great education. Great teaching is the thing that makes the difference. So whoever you are, parent, teacher, administrator, librarian, coach, uh, aunt, uncle, community friend, grandparent, whoever you are in the life of this young person who's trying to get an education or who should be trying to get an education, think about greatness. Aim for greatness. Think about being a great teacher. Now, I want to follow that up with a second question that goes along with that. So the first question is, who's the greatest teacher you've ever had and what made them so great? And the second question follows that with, what's the greatest book or books you've ever read? What are the most powerful, the most influential, the most moving, the most inspiring books you've ever read in your life? Think about that for a second. What titles are coming to your mind? What experiences are coming to your mind? What feelings are coming to your mind? And if you're struggling to get any, that is an indication of our modern society. You know, Alan Bloom, in 1987, when he wrote The Closing of the American Mind, which was a huge bestseller, but as I've talked to audiences around the North America, I've been surprised at how many people bought the book and never really read it or didn't finish it. So it was, a, it was a huge selling book that wasn't read nearly as much as it deserved. But he, was a, he wrote the book about being a professor at the University of Chicago, where each year he would get an incoming class of freshmen from all over the nation, the creme de la creme, if you will, of the nation who came in, and he would ask them this question, what is the, what is the greatest book that you've ever read? What is the book that means the most to you? What is the book that you have memorized or that you can stand up right now and, and quote passages from? And he found an interesting thing that while there were, while in the 1960s and into the 70s, most students were able to stand up with important classics that they had read, the Bible, the Declaration of Independence, Shakespeare, others, that by the 1980s, the end of the 1970s and the 1980s, most students didn't have much of an answer for that question. They couldn't really think of a book that was incredibly motivating for them or that they had memorized the words or memorized passages. In fact, the best that they could come up with was various pop music that, you know, they knew the, they knew the lyrics, they knew the words to the songs, they could, they could repeat the songs, and those songs were moving and powerful for them but they didn't really have books on that list. Now, there's nothing wrong with great music, but when a society loses that attachment to great books, it loses something precious. It loses what historically we have referred to as education. Because education, in a very real sense, boils down to coming face-to-face -face with greatness, great mentors, and great books, great learning. And by the way, when I say books, it doesn't just have to be the ones we read. It can be because great books are, or great ideas, are also composed and sculpted and painted and performed So, and, and discovered if we're looking at the, the mathematical and scientific fields. So we need to aim for greatness in education. And these first two questions are incredibly powerful. Who's the greatest teacher you've ever had and what made him so great? And... What's the greatest book or books you've ever read, the greatest things you've ever studied or learned from that, that really brought passion and excitement and, a, and depth and inspiration to your education? And if we take those two things and we combine them together, the greatest teaching and the greatest books, then we have the crux of TJ Ed, the crux of leadership education, the crux of a Thomas Jefferson education. Let me summarize. What Thomas Jefferson education is all about is combining, marrying those two concepts, the very best elements of great teaching and the very best materials to study 
and learn from in all of history, if you're including the classics, and in modern times and current things that are being written and, and produced and published. Put all those together and you have the center point of a great education. We call it TJ Ed, but there are other people out there who've never heard of TJ Ed who are great teachers and great parents and great leaders and great coaches because they've learned to bring those two powerful elements together, to settle for nothing less than real greatness in teaching and to introduce their kids to the greatest materials. And those are the first two keys, by the way, the first two keys of a great education, the first two keys of great teaching, and the first two key, great keys of, of Thomas Jefferson education. So what are they? Key one, read great things. Read the classics. Read the great ideas. Listen to the great m music and compositions. Study great architecture and great art and great scientific and mathematical discoveries. And the people who did the discovering and did the painting and did the sculpting. Study the great, the, the, the great statesmen. Study the great prophets. Study the great sages and leaders and philosophers, the greatest thinkers and the greatest leaders of history form the core of who we should be studying in education. Now, does that mean we don't study anything else? No. It means that greatness informs or is the center point of any student's education. The, the, the goal of any student's education is to help them come face to face with greatness so that they can look inside and discover the greatness that they have in, inside, inside themselves, the potential greatness, the genius that's in them. So the first key of leadership education, the first key of TJ, or just the first key of great education, period, is to read, study, great things. Not just textbooks. Sometimes we get caught up in that, but great things. And the second key is to be a mentor, not just a professor to be a mentor, not just one who professes, who lectures, who tells, but a true mentor who does all those things that you thought of when you thought of your greatest teacher, someone who really cares about the student as an individual, someone who really knows the topic and can help the student fall in love with the topic, someone who is passionate about learning and about the great ideas and about great things in the, in the stuff they're teaching. <coughs> Excuse me. So put those two together. And we have the, the core, the crux of great education. The seven keys are, we don't really, we don't have time today probably to hit all seven and really do them justice, but I'm going to hit a number of them, we'll see how far we get, that are really important because the more that we apply the great keys of great education and great teaching, the greater the quality the excellence, the passion, the inspiration, the depth of our educational experience. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the third key is inspire, not require. Inspire, not require. Now, this is a powerful key. This is, it's incredibly powerful because it makes all the difference in how a young person experiences education, experiences learning. See, too often in education, we get caught up in a number of the wrong things. I'll call those things schooling. Too often we get caught up in the, in the principles of schooling, whether that's classroom discipline or whether that's uh, making sure that we, that we teach to the test or focused on grade level or uh, focused on a certain plan and sticking to that plan. There are so many other things that go into schooling. But what we really should be focused on in great education is not so much schooling, but rather learning. And not just any learning, but great learning. Now that starts by combining all the elements of the greatest teachers. So we're aiming for greatness whenever we're teaching. And combining that with classics and other great works so that we combine it with truly great materials, whether those are books or whatever the other part of our curriculum. And as we combine those elements of great teaching and great materials, 
we have the environment for a truly superb education. Key three, inspiring. When we add to those other two elements, the active approach of every teacher, every parent, every coach, every, every leader, everybody involved in the, in the student's education, when we add to that the fact that they're trying to inspire, that they're focused on inspiring, then we take education to, an, to a whole new level. And it can be incredibly powerful. Again, that's hopefully what you're experiencing with that greatest teacher that you've ever had. And when you think of that greatest teacher, hopefully you have those feelings and, and that sense of, oh, there was that flow, that, there was that passion, there was that where you almost got lost in the study. And so much of modern schooling gets in the way of that passion. You know, you, you have 50 minutes and the student really gets into it and, and the passion starts to come and the inspiration and then the bell rings. And then he's got to go deal with lockers and hallways and, and, and socialization and, and assemblies and everything. And not that any of those are bad things, but to the extent that they get in the way of learning, then, then schooling can be a roadblock instead of a support. And when that happens, it's more than just a well. It's actually a tragedy. Anything that gets in the way of a superb, world-class, great, Thomas Jefferson-level education, anything that gets in the way of that, anything that blocks that, anything that distracts from that is a tragedy. Because imagine the potential of your children. Imagine the potential of each of your kids in their life if they got an education to match their potential, an education to match their mission, if they got the highest quality possible education that they could, imagine what that would do for their life and their potential and their impact and their service in society. It's huge. Inspire, not require is so powerful. Here's why. Anyone who ever got a great education did so through self education. Now, they may have done that in a formal setting. They may have done that in a school setting. They may have done that in, you know, with grades and credits. Or they may have done that away from those things. But anyone who ever got a great education at some point saw the value of it, embraced the importance of it, and made it theirs, took it on, made it their education. All great education is self-education. It's possible to get mediocre or even good education where you just do it through the system. But eventually, to get great education, a person must go a step beyond that. They must make it theirs. They must internalize it. They must embrace it. They must passionately do the hard work that is necessary to get a great education. I'm not talking about eight-year-olds here. I'm talking about 17-year-olds, 15-year-olds, and, and adults doing the hard work of day in and day out, putting in the hours to get a superb education and imagine what that does for their life purpose and their life mission and the opportunities that it opens up in their life financially as well as in, in just the more, uh, the more idealistic things like their relationships and their personal mission and their ability to serve and make a difference in the world. Combine all those things together, why would anybody settle for anything less than a great education? Again, great teaching, great classics, great materials set the environment. The spark that ignites it all, the catalyst that puts the whole thing in motion, is inspiration. An inspiring mentor makes all the difference in a person's education because it helps them embrace, passionately, excitedly embrace their own love of learning, their own excitement to get a great education. And when that happens, everything just ignites. Everything sparks. And they passionately go after a great education. When, when, a, when a young person becomes a self-educator and does it with a dedicated, passion and excited approach, there's almost nothing that can stop them from getting a great education. Here's the other side of that. When that doesn't occur, there's almost nothing that can give them a great education. So inspiration is the key. Inspiration is the, is the thing that makes it all work. Inspiration is the thing that puts it all together. And that brings us, by the way, to the two myths of education. Uh, modern education is most of it built 
on these two myths. And I speak about these in more depth in my book, The Thomas Jefferson Education. But these two myths are powerful. The first myth, and as I explain these, see if this doesn't just describe the modern educational environment. The first myth is that it is the job of teachers to educate. Think about that. That's a myth. It's totally false. It is not the job of teachers to educate. That's not their job. It is the job of students to educate. The only person who can choose and do the work to obtain a world-class, superb, great education is the individual student. No teacher can do that. There are no pills you can take and, wow, I've got a great education. A teacher can't just pour that in, into your brain. A teacher can't just, by osmosis, give it to you. It is not the job of teachers to educate. It is the job of students to educate. You show me a classroom or a school or a home, any educational environment, you show me one where the teacher thinks that it's his or her role to educate the students, and I'll show you a classroom or a home or an environment where the large majority of the students basically pass. They might learn some stuff. They might even get some decent grades. They might get awards. But they never embrace this deep passion of self-learning. On the other hand, you show me a home, a school, a classroom, an environment with a teacher who knows his role, her job, and knows that it is the student's job to get a great education. That brings us to the second myth. The second myth is that great teachers educate. No, they don't. Great teachers inspire. So let's push past the first two myths. It is the job of students to get a great education, not of teachers to give one. It is the job of teachers to inspire not to educate, that's the student's job, but to inspire. Show me a home with parents who inspire great education. Show me a classroom where teachers inspire great education. Show me any learning environment where teachers inspire great education, and I'll show you a home, a classroom, a learning environment where almost all, if not all, all or almost all of the students are passionately embracing and on a daily basis doing the work of getting a great education. It, it all boils down to the teacher. That is true. It really does. It all boils down to the teacher. But it boils down to the teacher not doing the learning, not doing the educating, but doing the inspiring. If a teacher inspires, if a parent inspires, if a leader inspires, then you can see it in their, in their kids. You can see it in their students. You can see it in those they lead. How do you see it? You see them doing the hard work day in and day out with passion, with excitement, with dedication, with commitment, and they just keep doing it. It's consistent. They keep at it because they are inspired. So when a student runs into a roadblock, the teacher who believes the myths sits back and says, what do I need to do to make this student do their work? What do I need to do to cause this student to behave better? The parent says, here's how I make Johnny learn to read. Here's how I make Mary study her math. That's based on the two myths. That's not inspiring. That's requiring. The teacher, the parent, the leader, who sits back and says, you know what? Johnny's not learning to read. How can I inspire him? to want to read with all his heart. How can I make reading so exciting, so interesting, so desirable? How can I incentivize it in a way that he just has this yearning inside? i got to read. I want to read. I can't wait to read. Man, reading, that's what I want to do. Same with Mary and Matt. Same with all the other subjects and all the other students. Show me a teacher. Show me a parent who does that and I'll show you great education. I'll show you a classroom. I'll show you a homeschool. 
I'll show you any learning environment, professional learning, seminars, professional training at a corporation, any environment. You show me a mentor, a teacher, a parent, a leader who knows how to inspire and works hard to do it through example, through the words they use, through the things they do. They sit down and think about what does Johnny, how can I, how can I inspire Johnny? How can I inspire Mary this week? What can I do that would really help? Not by giving her assignments, but by giving me assignments. What can I do that will spark that interest, that passion, that excitement? You show me that, and I'll show you great education. And by the way, combine those three together, great teaching, always trying to be a better teacher, great materials that they're studying and learning, and a mentor who understands that his or her role is inspiration and does it with all his heart and soul and does it well, you combine those three, that's TJ Ed. That's great education. That's leadership education. That trains young people to educate themselves with passion, with interest, because they've seen it modeled and they've seen how exciting and how fun and how wonderful it can be because they've watched someone, at least one, and hopefully more than one mentor, set that example and inspire that and do that. That's powerful. That's great education. Nothing else comes close. Nothing else comes close. Inspiration is so powerful because all great education is self-education. And because the two myths, when we get past them, when we realize that it's not my job as the parent to educate, it's the student's job to get the education. It's my job to inspire. Now, to do that, I'm going to need to set example. I'm going to need all these things we talked about. Or maybe with a given student because of his interests or because of his personality or because of his learning style or because of whatever or because of his background, whatever. Maybe with a certain student, all the things that, that the greatest teacher I ever had used, maybe that won't work on Johnny. What does a mentor do? Give up? Just start forcing? Bribe? Give, uh, give uh, negative consequences if Johnny doesn't do his homework? All of those things are based on the myths. Get past the myths. The great mentor sits down, gets a blank piece of paper and a pen, puts, writes Johnny at the top, and sits there and brainstorms ways to inspire Johnny. How can I be more inspiring? How can I inspire Johnny to love reading? How can I... Oh, and, and maybe the answer is it's not time yet. Maybe I inspire Johnny to something else that he's really passionate about already. By the way, this is, this is an important point of mentoring. If we're so caught up in what we want them to do that we don't notice how interested and passionate they are about a certain topic or a certain thing they want to learn or experience right now, then we're really not that, we're not very good mentors. Great mentors see the passions that Johnny and Mary and Tommy already have and build on those and help the student explore those. Because by doing that, you help them learn how to learn. How to, because they're already passionate about it, so take those things and run with them. And then eventually, if needs be, work them back to the things that you want them to do. Inspiration is the crux of it. Great teaching, settling for nothing less. Great materials, settling for nothing less. less. And great inspiring. Inspire, not require. If you ever find yourself requiring, you're taking the lazy way out. Now, it's interesting. In our modern world, because most of us have been on the conveyor belt, if so to speak, the, the factory approach to education, first grade, second grade, third grade, here's your math curriculum for this grade, who determined that some experts uh, passed by a legislature, you, you're supposed to learn this, we're going to test you at the end, compare you to all the other students. Because most people learned on the conveyor belt, we have an interesting way that we twist what I'm saying. I'm saying inspire, not require. You know how most people hear this or how many people hear this? They listen to what I'm saying. Even while they're listening, they might nod their head and go, yeah, yeah, inspire, that's good. I like insp it's, inspire sounds good. But then when they go home and they mull it over and they think about it and they decide to apply it to Johnny, to their classroom, to, to Mary in their home, in a homeschool, uh, in whatever setting they're, they're using, they tend to 
make a little switch on the words. And what they hear in their mind is, or they go tell it to their husband or their principal, and, and the husband or principal says, well, here's what that means. You can't do that. The thing that they translate it to is ignore, not require. I'll just ignore Johnny. I won't give him anything. I won't talk to him. I mean, if I can't require him to do math, if I can't require her to do reading, I guess I'm just ignoring her and let her do, letting her do what she, what she wants. Since I'm supposed to go with her passions or his interests, I guess that just means ignore them on, on things like math and, and reading. I, I, guess, I guess I'm going to ignore, not require. That is not what I'm saying, and that's not the principle of Greek teaching. That's not to do it. Ignore, not require, is not a path to great education. Inspire, not require, is very different. I would submit that inspire is very different than ignore for most students. Now, you may have a student. I've had a couple of students over the years who the best way to inspire them literally was to back off and let them do their thing. But that's made on a case-by-case -case basis with a student who already has exceptional gifts and is already studying their tail off getting a great education. And you back off and you don't get in the way of that. There's a time and a place for that. But that's, even that isn't ignoring because that is a choice that's consciously and conscientiously made because it's the best way to help that student get a great education. Are you seeing that part of all of this inspiration is individualizing and personalizing? So key. So great teachers always individualize. They always personalize to the needs, the pace, the interests, the passions, the methodology, the learning style of the student. And if they've got a class of 30, then they do it for all 30, and they, and they make it look easy, even though at first they struggled to learn to do that. That's great mentoring. That's great education. That's great leading. And it works, and it's powerful. Inspiring is so important. Think about it. If you compare inspiring to requiring to ignoring, which is the hardest? Of those three, which is the hardest? Is it hardest to ignore? No, that's the easiest. You ignore. You don't do anything. So now we're down to inspire versus require. Which is the most difficult? You've got a student who you feel really needs to learn a certain topic. And they're just struggling with it. Which is the most difficult for you as a mentor? Is it to go in there, read them the riot act, tell them what they're going to learn, tell them when they're going to learn it by and which homework they're going to have done by when or else? Or is it more challenging to sit down and figure out how to get them to love that topic, to embrace that topic, to want to study that and, and feel like it's the most powerful and important thing in their life, and they can't wait to study it more. They can't wait to get up in the morning and read more about it. Which is more challenging? Obviously, inspiring is more challenging. I think that's why so often we fall back on requiring. It's easier. It's just a lot less effective. Easier, yes, but, but way less effective. Inspire, not ignore. Inspire, not require. That is the third key of great teaching. Put together those three keys. Great teaching, settling for nothing less and doing everything you can to emulate the greatest teachers you've ever had and the greatest teachers you can learn about and the greatest teachers you've ever heard of and the greatest teachers you can interact with now. Using all of their gifts and all of the, and, and doing everything you can to make sure that you are the greatest teacher you can possibly be bringing in the very best materials, the greatest materials, in every field, in every topic, in every subject. Yes, you can use textbooks, but those should be part of it. The crux of it, the core of it, the passion of it, the heart of it, should be the greatest things on those topics, the greatest ideas, the greatest thinkers, the greatest leaders in history. And then finally, the third key, inspiring. Being an inspiring mentor who individualizes, who personalizes, who sits down and thinks through every single student's needs and passions and interests and goals and dreams. How often, how often have you as a parent, have you as a teacher, have you as a leader or a principal, by the way, the word principal is really powerful. 
the principal in the school used to be the principal teacher. They were the main teacher. Their main job was to inspire the teachers to be inspiring. They were the principal teacher because they knew every student and they went out of their way to help every student get a great education. That's what real administration is, if the goal is great education, if the goal is true great learning. But you put together those three and you become an inspiring teacher, an inspiring parent, education is going to go through the roof. Imagine, imagine the administrator in your school. Imagine every teacher in your school. Imagine you as a parent and both parents, if, if that's what exists in the home, sitting down and writing the name of each student on a weekly basis and asking, not what can I make Johnny do, but asking, what does Johnny need and how can I be more inspiring? What can I do this week that will help inspire Johnny to a whole new level? That is great education. That's the fundamental core of great education. You show me a home that does that, parents that do that, I'll show you a great homeschool where great education occurs. You show me a classroom that does that, where the teacher does that, I'll show you a great classroom. You show me a school where the administrator does all that and all the teachers do it and the administrator teaches them and helps them do it, I'll show you a great school. That's great education. Nothing else can do it at that level. Nothing else can do it that effectively. So those three things are so powerful when we bring them together. Those three things really work. They make all the difference. And inspiration can be so powerful when those things are brought together. We don't have time in, in this hour format to, to hit every one of the great keys. I'm going to skip number four and go to key number five. By the way, if you want to study more about these, and even if, even if you've already studied these before, these are worth review. These keys are worth reviewing over and over and over again. In fact, just like great basketball players, in their off-season will go practice the basics like dribbling and doing layups and simple close shots. Just like the great, the, the great artists will focus on, on the basics and practice and learn, great teachers go back over and over and over again to the seven keys and study them. We're not hitting them all today. In, in, our, in our book, Thomas Jefferson Education, they're all – they're all, well, that's what the book's about, is the seven keys and how to apply them. So hopefully you'll be able to follow up and study those and go in depth with those. But even if you just apply the things we're talking about today, it will take, it will take your role as a great parent, as a great teacher, as a great leader to a whole new level in all the people you're teaching. So let's skip to, let's skip number four, let's go to number five. Number five, key number five is quality, not Conformity. Think about that one for a second. Quality, not conformity. See, I mentioned earlier that too often in modern education, we get caught up in schooling and we forget learning. But great education is all about the learning and the application of what's learned to the real world in real life and to one's character and to one's service. That's what great education is. Great education can happen when there's great education can happen when there's schooling, but it almost always happens in spite of the schooling, not because of the schooling. And that's an important distinction. It's vital for parents and teachers and administrators and anybody else, coaches and librarians and everybody who's involved with the young person's education, it's vital that they understand this principle. Quality, not conformity. That's why it can be so powerful to look at Johnny's interests and passions and not necessarily make him jump into what you think he should be doing this month. Because if he has a passion and an interest, and let's say it's at a certain level, and you can help it go to a whole new, higher level, you're focused on quality. And that experience that Johnny has of going from level A clear up to level B or level C or level D will teach him more about learning <coughs> excuse me, than anything you can possibly teach him by pushing him through a subject he's not interested in. 
Now, can you combine that with also finding ways to inspire him to that important subject? Yes. But start where he has interest. Start where he has a passion. Start with the things he wants to learn about or she wants to learn about and help the student. Help the student go to a level of quality with whatever their topic of interest is. Because a student who goes to a level of quality in the study of his or her interests, firemen, horses, martial arts, uh, any subject, motorcycles, a person who, a young person who takes that interest in horses and takes it to the level of true quality is going to incorporate writing and history and discussion and reading and giving reports, maybe public speaking, uh, working with technology to study that up and, and to spread their ideas to others. If they take it to the level of quality, then you as a great mentor can help them learn great principles of education from that. There's no way they can get to the level of quality, no possible way they can get to the level of quality without learning an incredible amount just about learning. And then when you inspire them to the topic that you're so sure they need to study, and, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't, when you inspire them to that topic as a great mentor, they will have all those skills that were naturally learned in the area of their passion and their interest. That is great education. Quality, not conformity, is so powerful. Now, look at the way that grading is done because there, when we think in terms of quality, not conformity, it causes us to switch our whole approach to a great education. Here's how that works. For example, the elitist approach to grading is to say, well, we're going to have sort of a bell curve. We're going to have so many students with an A and so many students with an F, and then, and then there's going to be you know, so many students with a B and so many students with a D, and, 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 and a bunch of people are going to be in the middle, kind of in the CB range. That's the elitist approach. They turn in an assignment and you look at it and you say, well, this one's an A and this one's a B and this one's a C and this one's a D and that one's an E or an F and, and, that's, the, and that's the spread and that's, you know, that's elitism. That's a class system approach. That says, here's the bad students, here's the good students, here's the middle students. That's not great mentoring and it's not great teaching. Great teaching and great mentoring, inspiring instead of requiring, approaches grading, for example, a different way. And by the way, if you're a homeschooler, you probably don't even do grading. Hopefully not. If you're, in a, if you're in a more formal setting, consider this kind of grading. And even if you're in a homeschool, consider this kind of grading. This is the democratic approach to grading. A and DA. A means acceptable. Good. Good work. You did, you did great. Smiley face. Uh, gold star. You did, you did well. This is quality. Good job. DA means do it again. Do it again. Think of the quality that happens in, an ed in a young person's educational experience when a mentor takes the time to hand them back their assignment and say, you can do better on this and I'll help you. Here's some ideas. Over and over and over. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that with a seven-year-old. I don't have time to go into the four phases, but there are four phases of learning based on age. Please, please study those in the book. They're central. The four phases are key. They're powerful. Don't teach out of phase. But when you've got a person in their teens who really wants a great education and they're turning in assignments, they're turning in the, and you say to them, B or C, what a, what a missed opportunity to give them a DA and say, here's what you could do better. Here are things that I know would, would take this assignment you did to a whole new level. I think you missed, I know you could learn so much from this. Here are some ideas. Over and over and over again, help them. Help them do it. Quality, not conformity. So powerful. So effective. And I could go on and on with this. Those are just four of the seven. Please learn the other seven. Study them. Uh, you, can, you can learn about them from our book, Thomas Jefferson Education. There's materials on, online at our website, tjed.org. Um, please take advantage of those. Go learn, learn all seven keys and apply them. 
The other ones are just as powerful as the four that I've been able to cover here. TJ Ed is all about <clears throat> helping each individual student get the very best education they possibly could have. Why would we ever settle for anything less than that? Because it's easier, because it's cheaper, because why would we do that? In a homeschool setting, with it's it it's so natural to do great quality education. Great teachers in a formal setting know how to do it. You look at the great teachers, they've figured out how to apply these keys even in the system. Great education is a matter of combining these things together. When we do, it works. It's powerful. Try this exercise. Go to your students. Go to your children in your home. And just look at them. Look them in the eyes and find out what's there. Feel what's there. Think about what's there. Here's the reality. Here is the reality. This is another, this is a third myth of modern education. The third myth of modern education is that children come in all levels of brilliance and intelligence. That is absolutely false. Sounds crazy, but it's absolutely false. Every student, in fact, it's broader than that. Every person you have ever met, every person you will ever meet in your entire life has genius inside. Every student that's in your home, every child in your home, every student in any classroom you teach in has genius inside. Your job is to help them discover, develop, and use that genius to serve in the world. That's education. That's great teaching. That's great learning. That's TJ Ed. That's leadership education. That's what it all boils down to. That's what it's all about. Now, some people don't believe that every student who ever walks into your classroom, every student who ever comes into your home, some people don't believe that every student in your classroom in your home has genius inside. Let me say this. Whoever doesn't believe that, any person who doesn't believe that every student and child is full of genius has no business being a teacher has no business being an educator. Education is finding, developing genius, and then helping it serve the world. That's education. That's teaching. That's parenting. I get passionate about this. I, I get into this, but this is true. Great education comes from parents and teachers and other leaders who realize that every single person, every single child, every single student they interact with in any way has genius inside, and that their job is to use these seven keys to help that person get a truly superb, world-class Thomas Jefferson-level education. Don't settle for anything less. Thanks for your time today. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate being here. Thanks to Steve for, for putting this all together. It's great to be here. Thanks, Thank Oliver. You. There is an applause button, but it's really hard to find. In the participant window, if you hover over the smiley face, you can then go down to the applause button. <clears throat> Some of you are raising your hand, which serves as a form of applause. Um, Oliver, this uh, fulfilled my highest expectations. First, as a terrific voice in the homeschool alternative education community, but also the fulfillment of what I believe is um, a wonderful crossover between voices in different arenas, the library, the museum, the, the school arena, and the homeschool arena. And there's so many people I'm so anxious to introduce you to because uh, your voice is such a valuable one across the spectrum. Thanks for being here. Thank you. That was delightful. You knocked it out of the park. Uh, there was some good tweeting going on. Uh, you probably weren't able to watch the chat, but I'll send you a copy of that. I'm going to turn the recording off now. Jerry Mintz from Aero, the Alternative Education Resource Organization, is up. Jerry, a uh, pioneer in democratic education. The link is on your screen. You can actually click on that to open it up, and then once you're in that session, you can close this one down. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, thanks to Rachel as well. <laughs>